Uh, we're going to begin um, the teaching portion of this service with um, a reading from the Old Testament. We're going to get to Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, um, just after. But first, uh, Genesis 9, verses 1 through 6. That will be relevant for this teaching. I will allude back to it uh, later on. Genesis chapter 9 beginning in verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and on all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, and as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of a man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So this is the word of God. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. As I get there, you'll have time to get there too. Um, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, therefore, before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest the accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison truly i say to you you will never get out until you have paid the last penny let's pray our heavenly father we thank you for your inspired inerrant authoritative word we pray that we would hear from you this morning that you would minister to your people father you know our needs you know whether we need to be convicted of a particular sin or or comforted as we go through a um, particular trial. Father, I pray that ultimately you would be drawing us to yourselves, that we would love you more and love people the way we love ourselves. Pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Two men were driving in Southern California and they got into a battle of road rage after one of them cut the other one off in a parking lot. The hot-headed men sped out of the parking lot in a fit of anger, chasing each other, driving recklessly, weaving in and out of traffic, endangering many people until finally one forced the other into to, to carrying out of control. This driver were, uh, did everything he could to regain control, but in the process, an innocent little girl who was standing on a nearby sidewalk was killed. A young life was taken simply because two men became needlessly angry at one another. So we see from this real life illustration that comparing anger to murder, even humanly speaking, is not an exaggeration. 
You've been going through chapter 5 in the Gospel of Matthew. Last week, you looked at Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, and you learned two things about Jesus' relationship to the Old Testament. He said, I did not come to abolish the law. In the first century, the scribes and the Pharisees were the authoritative teachers. And so, in a way, they became so known as to be the authority that if anyone would say something that appeared to contradict their teaching, people would assume, well, then they must be denying the law of Moses. Jesus makes it clear. He did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law so that his followers' works would be greater than the works of the scribes and the Pharisees. That word fulfill can be a little bit confusing. It occurs 10 times in the Gospel of Matthew. The nine other times, it is clear what it communicates. It communicates that Jesus' ministry and teachings meet the expectations of the Old Testament. In this case, Jesus, fulfilling the law and the prophets, shows that he will show the true intent of the law. Just imagine Jewish ears in the first century, accustomed to hearing this phrase over and over again, thus says the Lord. These prophets were appealing to God in order that the, the people would hear their words as being authoritative. Jesus doesn't say, thus says the Lord. Instead, he says, I say to you, imagine being an Orthodox Jew back in that time, hearing those words. Who does this guy think he is? We begin a new section in the Sermon on the Mount called the Six Antitheses, where Jesus will take a topic and say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Six times, I, not thus says the Lord, rather, I say to you. And he's going to deal with topics such as anger that we're going to see today, lust, divorce, oaths, and retaliation. In, In each case, Jesus upholds the Old Testament and then offers its true interpretation. In our passage, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26, Jesus teaches on the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And he will show he did not come to abolish the law that teaches its true intent. He's going to say, you should not murder. And yet, even further than that, you should not be murdering in your hearts. He does not stop there. He goes even further. In fact, you should be reconciling to live in harmony with one another. And so, according to Jesus, reconciliation is the true intent of the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. So, my sermon in one sentence, we will look at the need, the way, and the motivation of reconciliation. So we begin in verses 21 and 22 with the need for reconciliation. If no one was murdering, we wouldn't need the command, you shall not murder. If people were applying the true intent of the law, we wouldn't need Jesus to come on the scene to say, yeah, that includes murder in your heart as well. In Jesus' day and our own, there is great need for reconciliation. And so we have this command you shall not murder, and then Jesus' interpretation for us. He begins in verse 21. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Jesus is not abolishing the sixth commandment. Uh, By the way, the Ten Commandments can be found in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. They would be in the list of chapters that you know that, that you know what, where to find uh, the, these Ten Commandments. Um, in the Old Testament, death was the punishment for murder. It was the most severe punishment uh, required for the worst kinds of sin. When I read Genesis 9, we saw God demands a life for a life. And theologically, the reason given for this punishment is that 
Man was made in God's image. Think about it this way. Whenever someone disrespects an American flag or really uh, the flag of any other country, people get really upset because of what the flag stands for. Disrespecting the flag is disrespecting the country. So I decided to do a little bit of uh, research on flag etiquette to see what were the proper ways to treat a flag, and, and I learned that it is considered disrespectful to use a flag as drapery, so you, you don't want to use a flag as a curtain or as a tablecloth, shouldn't be used to cover anything or as decoration, um, never for advertising purposes, and also, finally, a flag should never touch the ground. If you were to store the flag, it needs to be folded up neatly and ceremoniously. And so now, if people are so concerned about flags because of what they represent, how much more will God care for those who represent Him, those who bear His image, human beings? Genesis 9 Noah is told that because humans are made in the image of God, a life will be required for the taking of a life. Killing one of God's representatives is an attack on God himself and deserves death. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but we understand as Christians that with Jesus' coming, our relationship to the Old Testament law it is different than what it would have been in the Old Testament periods. We know that there are some commandments that we simply cannot apply or obey. If we were to bring a sacrifice to atone for our sins, we would be denying the work of Christ on the cross. So you don't want to do that. On the other hand, a command like murder, nothing about Jesus' coming makes murder okay for today. The Bible teaches different uses of the law. One would be in the Romans 13 kind of way where a, a government uses law to restrain sin in its society. A second use of the law that you can find in Galatians and Romans is that the law is like a mirror. It shows us our sin and then it points us to our need for a Savior. Thirdly, uh, the law also teaches us how to live a life pleasing to God. But one of the things the law never does is congratulate you on how well you are keeping it. And so it's interesting to see what the scribes and Pharisees did with a law like the Sixth Commandment, where they apply it. They believe it. They apply it literally so that if you have not committed a physical murder, then you stand righteous in God's sight. With this narrow interpretation, then, it would be possible to keep God's law and be righteous while being crippled with anger and bitterness towards a neighbor. Jesus shows that you can be a murderer even if you haven't physically killed anyone. In fact, he calls us all murderers to some extent, for we've all had murderous hearts at some point in our lives, and for some of us, very regularly. So avoiding physically killing another human being is the lowest bar to obey the sixth commandment. In Matthew 5, 22, Jesus expresses the full intent of the law by getting to the root of murder which is anger, and he does this with three parallel phrases. Verse 22, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, Murder may lead to judgment, but Jesus teaches anger leads to hell. Not all kind of anger is wrong. If you were to, to read the news and, and hear about a horrific crime, it would be appropriate to feel anger. In fact, it would probably be wrong not to feel anger at, at particular events. We also know that 
Jesus got pretty angry in his ministry when he found out that uh, people were selling things in the temple. We also have uh, Psalm 4.4, in your anger, do not sin. And so we know that some forms of anger are righteous and necessary. However, most of our anger is sin. It is sin that is hating. It is anger that is hating towards another person. It is the kind of anger that wishes that someone was dead. Generally, this kind of anger is not the response to a horrific crime, sin, or unrighteousness, but rather a wounded pride or broken ego in which we feel justified in being angry. We see in our passage that Jesus takes anger very seriously because of its destructive consequences. In some cases, there's no difference between one who murders and one who doesn't other than opportunity. It could be that two people experience the same level of rage, but one has the opportunity to kill and the other does not. In July of 2017 in Pennsylvania, a young woman had just graduated from high school. She was in her car driving. In another car, a 28-year-old man was driving. Both were merging into the same lane, and they were jockeying to see who would end up in front. And suddenly, the 28-year-old experienced a moment of road rage, took out his gun, shot her, and killed her. This man is a murderer, but would he not be a murderer at least in his heart, if he d didn't have that gun next to him? Is he any worse than others who experience the same level of rage with no opportunity to kill? Jesus is saying that even if he did not have a gun in his car, he would still be murderer-like. So Jesus really gets to the root of murder in this passage, which is anger. He's not making anything, he's not making up anything new. He's just highlighting the original intent of the law of Moses that was always concerned for the heart. Sometimes you'll hear, oh, in the Old Testament, people were concerned about external things, the external um, um, application of the law, and then Jesus comes in and makes it all about the heart. Here's an assignment. Read the book of Deuteronomy. Every time you read the word heart, underline it, you will see it is found throughout this book. And so Moses was concerned with the heart. I remember the last time I yelled at someone. It was a family member. You tend to be on your best behavior with other people, um, but not with family members. It was December 2015. Okay, um, okay, I do experience anger, I do get frustrated, but this was the last time that I was looking at someone and yelling in their direction. I just remember um, trying to be patient, and then I do not know what overcame me. I simply lost it. I'm still embarrassed to this day. My wife was there that day. <laughs> I wasn't yelling at her, um, but um, yeah, I mean... People were there. They know what I did. I was that guy that yelled um, that day. Um, I grew up in a family in which a lot of yelling took place. Have you ever noticed, um, maybe those who are married, when you are visiting your in-laws, you'll see that your spouse just starts acting differently than they normally do? It's almost like they, they go back to how they acted as a teenager. I think that's what happened to me in that context where I was familiar with, okay, yeah, we yell at each other. That's how we roll. My mind just turned back into that mode of thinking. And, and so I think that's what may have happened that day. I've been married five years, and I have never yelled at my wife. She has never yelled at me, and she will claim that her parents, that she has never seen her parents yell at each other. Yelling is a form of violence. Jesus' words against anger could not be more extreme. In the Old Testament, murder was punished by death. Jesus is saying anger punished with hell. 
God's grace is greater than our sin, but God's grace is not an excuse for us to go on sinning. Know this, eternal life, the abundant life that Jesus came to bring is not something you wait for until after you die. It begins in the here and now. And so if you have a habit of yelling at your spouse, yelling at your children, yelling at employees, kids, yelling at one another at school, I want to encourage you to take extreme measures to stop. Too often we think, oh, I yelled because that person did that thing. If that was true, why do some people yell and why do some people not yell? It's internal. It's not, do not blame your spouse when you're yelling at her. There's work that you can do. Uh, Christian counselors can help you to identify the root of your anger and work with you to help develop new responses to, to those triggers that, that make you mad. We will never reach perfection on this side of death or Christ's return, but God will heal you if you allow him. You need to make yourself available to his work. Get on your knees, pray, lament, worship, delight in God, fast, show that you're serious about this, meditate on God's word, spiritual food. Don't just do this for 30 seconds in the morning. That will not affect your way of life. But as we practice these spiritual disciplines, God renews our minds. Anger will not just disappear if you do nothing about it. If you have a habit of yelling at your spouse, yelling at your children, you will continue to do that unless you take extreme measures it's like trying to lose weight without a plan. Could happen, but probably not. You need to come up with a plan. Be serious about this. Because of our murderous hearts, enmity, and anger, God gives us commandments. Thou shalt not murder. Do not angry, uh, be angry. But now in verses 23 through 26, uh, Jesus provides the way of reconciliation. The way of Jesus is not one simply of refraining from evil, okay? If that was the case, we would live perfect lives if we locked ourselves up in a room and never interacted with anything. That is not the Christian life. Jesus sends, out, sends us out into the world in order to shine before men. In verses 23 to, and through 26, Jesus offers two illustrations about reconciliation. The first in verses 23 and 26. Jesus says, if you're about to bring an offering and there remember that someone has something against you, leave your offering and go reconcile with them. Very importantly um, to this is the context Jesus is talking in Galilee, which is at the very north of the promised land. You, you didn't just bring an offering to your local synagogue. You had to go down to the temple. If you remember in the Old Testament, the northern kingdom, southern kingdom, Jerusalem is in the southern kingdom. They were 80 miles between Galilee, where Jesus is talking, and the temple the place where you offered your sacrifices. And so Jesus is suggesting, leave that animal, go make a one-trip journey, and then come back. This teaching is extreme. And, and the reason Jesus uses such extreme language is to show God is serious about right relationships. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, we read, if anyone says, I love God, and then hates his, his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so maybe you need to respond to Jesus this morning. Respond to this illustration. Feel free not to do this now, but maybe some of you will have to apologize to your spouse 
uh, some will have to apologize to their children. You know, I like asking this question to adult, uh, adult around my age. I ask, do you know, do you remember a time when your parent apologized to you? I think nine out of ten I hear, nope, n never been done. M maybe they're forgetting, but, but there may be something there, and there is a need for parents to apologize to their children when they wrong them. It could be a friend at school, a colleague at work. We are called to reconcile. And in the second illustration in verses 25 and 26, Jesus encourages us to reconcile quickly with those who may be accusing us of any wrongdoing. If we do this, we will be spared of so much drama and headache that comes along with ongoing conflict. In both of these illustrations in verses 23 through 26, Jesus stresses positively what it looks like for his disciples to obey the commandments, you shall not murder. More than just avoiding murder and getting angry, positively, in the words of Paul in Romans 12, 18, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with everybody. You know, sometimes reconciliation is impossible. You may try to apologize to someone and they just reject your apology. In that case, You've done your part. Doesn't mean you can't try again a week later, but at times, for whatever reason, you have done something and someone will just not want to be reconciled to you. In other cases, you may have been offended and your offender may have uh, an inflated view of themselves where, where they couldn't imagine possibly ever hurting you and will always deny uh, ever um, causing you any harm. In those cases, it is hard as well to reconcile, but as much as it depends on us, we want to forgive quickly, confess our sins quickly, and every time we reconcile, we are positively fulfilling the commandment, you shall not murder. May Jesus' words convict us. And on this side of death, or Jesus' return, we will never truly live up to the expectation laid out for us in this text. We need help. And the motivation this morning to be reconciled to one another is the gospel. The biggest mistake that we can make is to assume that because we cannot perfectly live in harmony that we're not even going to try a little bit. Christ suffered the consequence of our unrighteous anger toward other people. He faced God's righteous anger at our sin, and now he offers us peace. Christians, you have no choice in this matter. If you have peace with God, you must strive for peace with others. By definition, Christians are reconciled people who reconcile with others. Paul outlines the implication of God's reconciliation with us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This ministry that we're given as Christians is to proclaim the gospel, which is the message of reconciliation. But we cannot, with integrity, call people to be reconciled to God if we are not ourselves willing to be reconciled to one another. If we take Jesus seriously, we must take relationships seriously, to live consistently and allow people to see the gospel lived out in our lives, we must reconcile because God reconciled us to uh, himself. The way we become Christians is by asking and receiving forgiveness, and that becomes the name of the game for us. We are people who ask for forgiveness, receive forgiveness, and then extend that to other people. 
our efforts to reconcile has huge potential to be a great witness to others. Parents, your children are watching. If you live in, in a workplace where you are the only uh, Christian or, or children, kids at school, if you have lots of unbelieving friends, you are being watched. And every attempt to reconcile will shine bright in a world full of anger and bitterness. Um, in the book Grace of Giving, Stephen Olfer tells a, a story of an old Baptist preacher during the American Revolution. His name was Peter Miller. He lived in Ephrata, which is a town in Pennsylvania, and he happened to enjoy a friendship with George Washington. In Ephrata also lived Michael Whitman, an evil-minded sort who did all he could to oppose and humiliate the preacher. One day, Michael Whitman was arrested for treason and sentenced to die. The preacher, Peter Miller, traveled 70 miles up to Philadelphia to plead for the life of the traitor. No, Peter, General Washington said, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. My friend, exclaimed the old preacher, he's the bitterest enemy that I have. What, cried Washington, you've walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts it in a different light. I'll grant you your pardon. And he did. Peter Miller took Michael Whitman back home to Ephrata, no longer an enemy, but a friend. Let us obey the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, Jesus' way, not by simply avoiding murder or avoiding anger, but rather, rather positively striving for harmony in all of our relationships, in all our spheres of life, the family, the workplace, and the church. Let us live out reconciled lives flowing out of Christ's reconciliation of us by what he did for us on the cross. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you first and foremost for the gospel. We thank you for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life on our account, offering his life for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we thank you for what happened on the cross, great reconciliation between us sinners who had no hope based on our own works to have a relationship with you. We thank you for Jesus' accomplished work on the cross for us, giving us a perfectly clean slate, peace with you, a relationship with you. And not only that, you have given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to live lives that are pleasing to you. Father, perhaps one of us or some of us in this room may um, have anger problems. We know that you take this very seriously. We know that um, anger is a form of violence and has a great impact on family and friends. So, Father, we pray that through your Spirit, you would convict us of any sin and, and seek to do whatever it takes to, to grow in that particular area. Father, since we know that the gospel is a message of reconciliation, we pray that whether we have offended someone or know that someone is hurt because of something we may have said, we pray that um, we would take the initiative, that you would lay it upon our hearts to seek that person out and, and reconcile. Father, even now, more importantly, we pray that as those who have been reconciled and been given the message of reconciliation, you would give us opportunities this week to share the great news of what you have done for us on the cross, offering us the forgiveness of sins and that more people would come to know you as we are faithfully seeking to share the gospel, that you would be glorified in our lives. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.